Okay, this is really exciting stuff. I never ever thought I was going to be able to do this in exile. This is some text taken from a Kabbalist named of the Leshem. That was his that was his nickname. Leshem because actually his name was Rabbi Shlomo Eliashuv. Rabbi Shlomo Eliashuv was called the Baal HaLeshem. I think because maybe the name Shlomo, if you take the names of the letters of Shin, Lamed, Mem, and switch them, it's Leshem. Leshem Shabov Yachlama is actually was the name of what he was called. Actually, it says it here, in front of your book. It was actually, I think, one, the third row of the breastplate of the Kohanim, in the terms of the stones. Okay, I don't know what the, cor- the correlation is between the stones of the, you know, Unless he was the third child, and maybe the third, I don't know. Anyways, he's known, his nickname is known as the, the Leshem. Okay, a little bit more background. I can pass around this picture of him, because he didn't live too long ago. Okay. He was a great Kabbalist, whose vast knowledge of all aspects of Torah, and exceptional ability to clarify complicated concepts resulted in a few crucial Kabbalistic works which he wrote. Okay, he wrote such as this work, this work here from this book is called the Drushe Olam Atahu, which is called basically Lech, uh, um, Olam Atahu means the work, the, 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 the world that is astonishingly empty, as it says in the first verse of, of Genesis. And the world was Tohu Vabohu. So he has a whole drush on all the primordial existences, the primordial worlds. The Death of the Kings, which some people who have been in my class have learned before. And he wrote a whole book on just the death of those kings, the shattering of the vessels, very complicated stuff, but he makes it in such a, 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 a very descriptive and very informative way. Okay, And he also wrote, wrote other works. Um, he lived 84 years, from 1941 to 1925. The reason why I'm learning this is also because it has to do with Passover. It was yesterday was his yard site. So I did do a class on Shabbat, and it, uh, on this topic specifically, and my pr- father-in-law privied me to such texts, to the Leshem, which was, <sighs> how do you say it? Once somebody has tasted it, they go nuts over it, okay? Once somebody has tasted the Torah of the Leshem, but then again, not many people know about him. He was in Lithuania, and the only story that I do know about him, which my father-in-law told me, which was that there were some students going, that is the unstable copy. You've got it. Just take the whole thing. Be ready to share with Jane when she comes in. Okay? Because unless you want to go in there and try to figure out the machine and make your own make copies. The only story that I know, because he's... When you read his text, you're like going, oh my gosh, this guy's an expert in every single thing. He knows exactly where everything is, and there's like, like, and he's rattling it off like this. He's an expert in every single text everywhere. So you went to, uh, oh, no, so, so the Havetz Chaim, some students were traveling to Israel, and they were saying goodbye to the Havetz Chaim. They wanted the blessing from the Rebbe, and they said that they were going a certain way and passing through the town where the Leshem is. Okay? So he says, you must, if you're passing through that way, you have to go see the Leshem. You must go see him. Because why? You will not see him in the next world. This one play, he's going to be so high and so beyond anybody, you're going to get a glimpse of him. So you better get him now. Catch him now. Don't think, oh, I'll catch up to him later. Uh-uh. You better go get him. Okay? His, class, his name is Shlomo Eliashuv. Um, his grandson was... Uh, the Rav Eliashuv, who was a huge uh, leader in the, in, in the Jewish people in Jerusalem. He was a codifier of Jewish law. Everyone would come to him shyly. He was an Adam Gunnel, one of the leading rabbis, okay, that people would come to for a very, very important questions, okay? I merited to get a bracha from him. And uh, Anyways, he, as Eliashuv got older, Rabbi, the Leshem got older, okay, he couldn't write anymore, so he had his grandson, Rabbi Eliashuv, do his writings for him. So everybody knows Eliashuv, the, the one who passed away just recently, the big Adam Gadol. But everybody craves all the Litvaks. Do you know what a Litvak is? Yes. The Lithuanian Jews, the Misnagdim, the ones who 
aren't Sephardic, right? They crave to learn this stuff. They can't do it because they just have this kind of hiccup where they kind of like... But the word litvak, do we get back to that? Doesn't just mean it's now meant for a midnight. He doesn't have to be from Lithuania anymore. Right. So he's a an opponent of Chassidut. Exactly, opponent yeah. of Chassidut, an opponent of mysticism. Right. He basically is satisfied okay, with so just learning the Talmud out, and he's the revealed a parts. Jew, but now right. it has a more general. Of course, and that's why I'm saying I'm saying if you go to any Litvak, I'm telling you, rabbis came here and approached me because they know that I study these texts, and they go, "Can you teach me the lashon?" <laughs> and I went and studied with one guy and he like, make it lower, don't talk so loud because other people were in the study house <laughs> like I'm going they're on pin and nook, you know and this olam and the olam of the bria gets here and sees put it down okay <laughs> okay. I desisted from learning with him because you know, just uh, I wasn't ready, he wasn't ready for whatever reason, it didn't work okay so in any case, he wrote it, in this parsha, in this portion about the exodus of Egypt Okay, which is something that's a great preparation and really some novel, great novel idea. Okay, that we have now. I'm going to do it in Hebrew, so you guys are going to have to go ahead and follow me in the English. I'm not going to start there first. I have to give a little bit of hakadama because he's starting in what we call a in simon hay. Okay, let me just get the right page here. I'm not on the right page. Okay, so I have to give you a little bit of a background just before we head into this in terms of where is his explanation of what went on in Egypt, what was going on before Egypt, okay? That the way that things go in the world is usually, if, if, everything be, if everybody is, is, behaves, things go smooth, right? And, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of a balance that needs to be struck, but sometimes things get out of hand, such as the flood, such as the generation of the dispersal, what do we call the Tower of Babel, where things get out of hand. Right? Then Hashem's got to step in. And he's got to redirect things in, in a magnanimous way. Okay? So the, uh, the way that what was happening in Egypt with the Jewish people suffering in... Um, suffering in Egypt. I mean, Paro was having a bloodbath every single night. He would have children slaughtered because he had a skin ailment. And I don't know who prescribed the bloodbath, but he was basically having a bloodbath of Jewish children every single night. Horrific. Beyond. The, you know, the, the things that, that, was, that were going on in Egypt was leading to a, to, to a state where the world was going to fall apart. And so Hashem had to step in. And he was under a big, huge dilemma. When you're going to step in and do things, there's going to be a big dilemma. Okay, I see I'm going to have to pause here. And we're going to have to make photocopies for people. Okay? <laughs> Who has the unstable? No, we can, uh, we can share. We share? I'm then you got to sit next. Oh, okay, great. Okay. We'll share. We'll okay, share. fine. <laughs> All right. So, the world was falling apart. Mitmotate. The world was falling up. Was it just about to converge where, you know, Hashem's going to have to do something, bring a flood, but he can't do a flood anymore because he promised Noah he can't do a flood. Right? So what are you He would have to do something very drastic. Okay? So, you know, so, so of course what would happen, it, was, it wasn't an, you know, I hate to say this, you know, but in our very simplistic way that we understand things, you know, a decision had to be made. Uh, an Eitzah, actually, how the Leshem puts it, he had to have a piece, he had to employ some advice. Because what, what's going to happen when Hashem steps into creation, there is the purpose of creation that we know, that we always studied, which is that Hashem wants to bestow of His kindness. And then there's the means to get to that. There's God wants to bestow, and then there's how do you get to that ultimate bestowal of good. And that is the unbelievable necessary ingredient called free will, which means God has to be hidden. He can't be revealed. But yet here, He's got to do it. He's got to do it. It's a huge predicament. I got to step in. I got to pull aside the curtain and I got to shift things around because the world is going to end up being a disaster. It's going to fall apart. The Jewish people will be lost. All of the seed of Abraham will be lost. Right? And so we'll be in a stuck situation. So, I'm just trying to find that. I think. Jewish. 
Okay, so the idea really is, I don't know why I'm not finding it. Right here. You're looking for Simon and Hay? I think I got it. Yeah. No, 355. Okay. Well, I've, I've got a different book than you. Okay, here we go. So in order to, to do things, he had to do what we call, and I'm just cutting to the chase here, he had to push what's called the reset button. Okay. Okay? He had to push a reset, but when you have to, when you're going to push a reset button, okay, as we do on our computer, when the computer crashes, right, or something like that, you just have to do a reset, and hopefully it'll start, and it'll won't start in safe mode, and hopefully you'll be able to access all your data again. You're bringing up an image of a big blue screen. <laughs> this is a reset button on the whole dividing, on, on, on the entire guiding forces of the world, okay? This is a... Huge decision. Huge. Okay. Okay. So, so in pushing the reset button, there's two things that get reset. Three things, sorry, that are going to get reset here. And they happen at three different times. The first thing of these, I'm just finding the language here. We call it Hidhachut. Going out of Egypt is about Hidhachut, which means about renewal. So there's three things that he had to renew in the time of the redemption from Egypt. And this is one thing that he, redeemed, that he had to do was called the ore of God's kindness, the light of God's kindness, which is what we always talk about, which was the entire goal of creation that Hashem wanted to bestow of his goodness to another. So that light of God's kindness, that light of bestowal, had to be renewed. Okay? That's one thing that had to be renewed. And then there was a second thing that needed to be renewed, which was the ore of God's kedusha, the light of God's holiness. The way I understand God, the light of God's holiness, which was basically, it's the relationship value, which means there is a recognizing of the creation that God is singling them out, i.e. the Jewish people, and therefore this, the creation itself, the Jewish people, accept God's providence and sanctify themselves and become sanctified as a result of that relationship. It's a relationship, okay? One is just God's just giving. The second one is there's kind of a, a receiving kind of thing. And the third thing that God had to renew was evil. He had to push the reset button on evil. So that, these three resets had to occur at different times. The first thing, the light of God's kindness, was during the entire ten plagues. Everybody saw the divine providence that God was totally in the picture. He was orchestrating each one of the ten plagues the Egyptians were hit with, and yet the Jewish people, nothing, right? They had light in all of their habitations, no frogs in their boundaries, nothing, right? So they saw that they were being looked, they saw God's benevolent kindness, but yet the real, the second light, called the light of holiness, that happened on Seder night. Seder night is such a cavaltic night. The lights are so huge on Seder night. Okay? As a matter of fact, the way I understand it, that the way that all of the Kabbalists bring down what happened on the night of the Seder was that the, the, the influx became huge at that point in time. The influx of light energy, there was an insight, there was a euphoric high that everybody was in the middle of experiencing. Okay, they saw God's presence, and the way I I'm, I'm giving I'm bringing a crude example here, very crude. It's Cinderella going to the ball. Okay, because here's the here's the, uh, the the scenario is of course the Jewish people are uh, Cinderella, made to work, right? Wash the floors, do the dishes, and then you can go to the ball, Cinderella. Okay, <laughs> and the wicked of course the wicked stepmother is Paro, and of course the stepsisters are the Egyptian people and of course the night of the Seder the Jewish people are introduced to the prince they have an unbelievable connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu in a way that is beyond but of course after that day after the first day of, of, of the holiday lights out okay and then Cinderella or the Jewish people have to count seven weeks Actually, right? Seven weeks. Right? Seven days, seven sets of seven, forty nine. They have to count fifty days until set 
the renewal button for evil. Okay? Because evil could not be eradicated then. For the big reason of? Right? Free will. What? what? Free will. Right. Because if God is stepping in and the people really aren't on the level, okay? They can't handle the Egyptians, the oppression of the Egyptians, but they really don't have any merit of, them, of their own to do anything. So, and that's what the Leshem is going to explain here. So let's do this text, okay? And I don't want to go into the parable, I can't do it in mixed company, the whole idea of the resetting of evil, which happened at the Sea of Reeds, but it is a very extremely deep concept, okay? So in any case, let's start with, I'm in Simon Hay there, okay, and I'm in that where you guys have it. I don't have an English translation, but you guys are going to have to uh, bear it, okay? Where does this first page go? Okay, fine. There are four exiles that we have in our tradition, and that is really occurs every single place in the Chumash, Okay. Meaning, even in the very first verses of Genesis, it speaks of out, and the earth was astonishingly empty, and and the Bereshis Baralokim ate the Shemayim ate the Aretz Aretz Haisa Tov Avohu. The earth was astonishingly and empty, Tohu Bavohu, and darkness was on the face of the deep. Okay, each one of those words represents the four exiles. Four, only four. Okay. So we have in our tradition also when Abraham was also in the bris bain of Asarim, we say that there was a special ceremony that, that Avraham did by the covenant between the halves. Mm -hmm. And it also brings the words in there. Also, the Midrash brings down. Also, the four exiles were hinted to there. As a matter of fact, more specifically, even the animals were representative of those four exiles. When Abraham fought the war against the four and five kings, what do you think that was? It just happens to be four? What a nice number. No. It was a four representing the four principal exiles. I. What happened to Egypt? Why isn't Egypt considered an exile? It is the classic exile. It's in the Chumash. But yet in our... Penina Groise Okay. So here we have... Classically, thank God I remember the page number, right? Yes. That's amazing. So here, if you see here, you'll see the name of Yud K Vav K quite clearly right here. Yud K Vav K. Here you go. Thank you. Okay. And then you'll have just above that, you'll have what's called the tip of the Yud. Kutso Shel Yud. Keter. The top. The top drop. The tam seat. Tom seed is like an extract. It's right. the it's the main root where everything is going to flow from. Now you have Yud Kevavke as a very as a divine name, but you know. <laughs> the name of God, you'll also have on the other side, side of Klipa, and you'll have the root of holiness, which is the tip of the Yud. You'll also have the tip of the other side, which is Egypt. It is the paradigm of all exiles, and all exiles are included in it. Okay? And that's what he says here, because Mitzrayim is the, is the root of all of them. It is the inclusiveness of all of them. We call it the, the kutso shel yud, the thorn or the tip of the yud, and it is the crown of the klipa. It is the head of all of the klipa, which is the forces of evil in the dark realm. Al Shem okay, this is from, uh, he brings it from the Sefer Gilgulim, uh, reincarnation. And this is what they mean in the Midrash, that there is a certain Midrash which says, Kol HaMalkiot Nikro'u Al Shem Yitzrayim. All the kingdoms are really called on Egypt. Ki hi haisa hashorish l'kulam, because it is the root of all of them. Vahashorish de kol haklipa kulo, it is the root of all evil. L'chein haya ba makas b'chorus, and that's why in Egypt we had the tenth plague, which is just the plague of the first Are the source to all of our problems. There is no middle man, no middle path. And just like what it brings in Shoh Chartov, if, if it would if it would be to a man that he would have a situation of tsar, of pain or suffering, 
לא יהיה קורא לא למיכאל ולא לגבריאל, you should not call מיכאל, you should not call גבריאל, אלא קורא עושה, you should call me, ואני עונה, and I will answer. In other words, if a person is ever in a situation of stress, he should not call on the angel מיכאל and גבריאל, he should call on me, I'm the one who does it. And that's really mitzvah number one. If you would retranslate commandment number one of the Ten Commandments, that was a direct download to all of our neshamas, we heard the first two, is, I am Hashem, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And they all ask this question, wait a minute, I get the commandment, I am Hashem, your God, shouldn't it be, I am Hashem, your God, who created heaven and earth? I am Hashem, your God, who created everything? Why is it, I am Hashem, your God, who brought you out of Egypt? Why that one? Why specifically explain? Bring that as a you know as a as, as a um, introduction, okay? And the idea really is, I Egypt was the no win scenario. You cannot get out of it. There was a story though, really recently in Israel. I have to tell you this one. It's a cool story. It's a true story. This woman, you know, last year when they were doing all the stabbings, mm-hmm. and you know, people were getting stabbed. Oh, Elena, Hashem, Yishmor, Hashem should continue to protect us even Amen. greater. That there was a woman who was getting followed by a boy, by a, an Arab boy, and she was freaked out, and she was following and walking down the street, and he was turning that corner, and she turned that corner, and he was turning her, and you know, she was like saying, you know, she was mumbling something, and she walked to a police sta- station, or she found a policeman, you know, and they did a, you know swarm and they, they, they arrested him mm-hmm. and they were questioning both of them, not together, of course, but they questioned her and they questioned him. And they questioned her and she says, you know, I saw him, he looked suspicious, he's going there, I just kept praying all the time, Michael Biamini the Gabriel Bismali. Michael at my right, the angel Michael at my right, and Gabriel at my left. Michael, Gabriel, Michael, Gabriel, Michael, Gabriel. All the time that she was walking towards the police. And they interviewed the Arab boy, and the Arab boy says, I was, yeah, I was supposed to stab her, but there were these two bullies, these two big guys, who were right by her side the whole time. I couldn't catch mm-hmm. her alone. Oh, no. Now, if you, get, if, you, if you look at it, a, a camera, there was nothing there. But this guy saw it. This guy, there were two guys there. What could I do? Walking right next to her. Right? Bizarre. That is yeah. awesome. You know, they weren't in cahoots. Okay? You know, cahoots, and they weren't... Names. Avigdor, Avisocho, he had seven names, right? Tuvia, right? He had seven names. Why was he called Moshe? I like Moshe Rabbeinu. Well, because that's what you're used to. <laughs> Tuvia is pretty cool, okay? They called, Mom called him Tuvia because it was light in the room when he was born, right? Oh. Yeah, Avisocho, I had other names, seven names. Why was he called Moshe? Um, my show, my school, too. Ah, when she did the act of pulling him from the water, she impressed upon him. That act impressed upon him. His mission in life, okay? Well, the word is Moshe. That's the whole word, All right? right? But or the Mishisiu. first two then, you know, that's where Moshe is. The way I am. Okay, it's because, so his name is Drew. He was drawn, drawn from the water, okay? So, but in any case, it doesn't matter, right? There's two of you. He, was, he had two of you before. He was lighting this in the, in the house. She drove from the, uh, who's the, Because that, when she did that, she impressed upon him an identity, a huge identity, right? It had a to- total effect on him and sanctified him for a mission. And his mission was, of course, to draw the Jewish people out of Egypt. Okay? He was drawn. He draws. Okay? He, the Jewish people, God came and took the Jewish people out they became sanctified to him. They, they, there, was a, 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 there was a value. There was a, a relationship value. Okay? What's the Hebrew word? What? What's the Hebrew word? For what? To draw out. Moshe. Mishisihu. Mishisihu. Letters. I don't know how to do it. I can't spell it. After. Just write it down and I'll do it after. So our, our God also, and here's the point here, He also uprooted the evil inclination from them on that night of Passover. <coughs> and he sanctified the Jewish people to him. 
just like what is written in Parshat Emor, he's quoting Zohar here and there. V'stalku Yisrael merushusa acharav is akrumine. The Jewish people were removed from the from the from the domain of evil, from the other side, and they were uprooted from it. And they were joined by Matzah Kashura Kadisha. I still don't understand this line. If anybody can explain this to me, they became joined with the mat, with Matzah. How does, how does that line translated? Anybody with me? They yeah, unified, 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 the holy unified, binding. Again, again. Unified with matzah. They became unified with matzah. Do you know the map? The holy map? It's called the kingdom of, of Atzilut, which means it's a very, very high place in the spiritual realm. Okay. Uba Parshas Bo, Daf Mem Amud Aleph, Lo Nafku Yisrael Mimitzrayim Ad Istavru Kuluhu Shaltunim De Leela Mishul Tunayhun. The Jewish people did not go out of Egypt until it was broken. All of the domination of above, from their domination, and the uh, Nafku Yisrael Mushu Saihun, and the Jewish people left from their domain and went to the, the holy domain the holy cosmic domain of the Kodesh Baruch Hu, and they became bound with him. In other words, he's quoting from the Zohar here. I don't know if you have it in your text. Yeah. All of this was made by the Kodesh Baruch Hu himself because of his love for the Jewish people. Nevertheless, that you have to know, Egypt was then the head of defilement and the whole generality of the Sitra Achra Kula. In other words, it had the whole root of every single thing evil within it. And when God revealed himself, may his name be blessed, in the time of the redemption, so then, then it stood to be nullified then, all of the forces of the other side completely. Therefore, there was a need to give strength or a new power to evil also in order that it should not become nullified habakira the free will and to ulachadesh et akium he had to go ahead and renew the existence for the reason that we know okay in other words evil had to be renewed so this is an, here is the step number 1 that he's making towards what happened on the night of passover and this is where he explains it now and this is the deep understanding of the intention of what the verse says, that in terms of when they left Egypt, it says that they were driven out from Egypt and they could not delay, right? Everybody knows this verse. They couldn't hang out anymore. They got driven out fast. What's the point here? What's going on? Why did they have to get driven out so fast? Were they afraid of the Egyptians? Pharaoh decided it is... Okay, you got to go ahead. You got the green light. All right, Pharaoh, You're afraid Pharaoh, Pharaoh's going to change his mind? All of his uh, chayalim and... They drove, they escorted him. They got right. cars and they got right. ready. Well, horses. Doesn't it say with his riders in... When they chased them at the sea, right. they had so horses. We back the horses. Yeah, they're not going to escort them, would they? They had the horses in the house right. because of their... It's in the homage. And, they, and the Rashi comments right. about that. There were some Egyptians that, that, that believed in Moshe. They were afraid, and they put, their, kept their, they put their horses in the house during the plague of hail. They kept their horses inside. So when it came time to chase the Jews, they go, I got a horse. I got 50 horses. And they go, wow, where'd you get those horses? Trust me. Right? That's why they say the best of the Egypt, you have to crush their heads. The best of the Egyptians. Okay, that was again the phrase. Don't think that they're, you know, oh, they feared God until it came time to chase the Jews. Okay? In any case, we're going to see the, the phrase classically is understood that they had to be chased out of Egypt and they could not delay is classically understood that they will go into the 50th gate of Tuma. But he says, Bahari Kasha, there's a Kasha. Fourth, first draw, you have right there. <laughs> they knew exactly where it was. Okay, they knew they, the plague of darkness, the plague of darkness, the Egyptians couldn't move. 
They couldn't move. They're stuck in their houses. And Moshe told all the Jewish people, you have to go and scan every single house for, to find out where that jewelry is because we have to take it on our way out. We have to do it. The, Egyptians, the Jews didn't want to do that. You must go do it. So they went in the house. Of, here's, the, here's the Egyptian. He's in the house and he can't move. And like, Who's there? Right? Somebody's in his house walking around. Right? Who's there? You know, and who knows what kind of what's going on in his mind, their mind, whatever. They found out where all the jewelry was, and then they had to go and ask him for it. They weren't afraid then. The biggest thing was that we have before Passover, which is Shabbat, Shabbos Hagadol, or Shabbat Hagadol, okay? Which is the huge miracle that happened. The huge miracle. Here we've taken the goats and the sheep, and we're tying it to the beds. Now this is, a, this is a breaking news. The Jewish people are bringing sheep into their house, tying it to the bed. So the reporters go in and interview them. We're going to take this and we're going to slaughter it in four days and then we're going to eat it, right? This was the God of the Egyptians. This was the God of the Egyptians. Breaking news. CNN, the reporters, debates. You understand they're, in, they're on fire here, okay? They're on fire. They're taking our God and they're going to slaughter it in four days? You think there'll be some kind of pogrom? Let's go. We don't take this sitting down. Get our pitchforks. We get, you know, get Lou and, and Leroy. Let's go march into them. You know, break some head. They ain't going to do that to our God. Right in this, that, that, that the Hippa zone. Which was the, the how do they translate chipazon? Quickly. The quickne, quickness, the quickliness was mishum delo yechnasu b'sharach hamishim, so they don't enter into the 50th gate of, of, the, of the 50 gates of Tuma, the 50 gates of defilement. Hine, liena anxiety, according, behold, according to my humble opinion, it is impossible to say that. Why? Uh, the other way around. Everything was becoming nullified. All of the forces of impurity were becoming completely nullified. Completely. Because why? The whole divine presence was revealed to them. Cinderella was at the ball, dancing with the prince. What are you talking about? Where's evil then? There's nothing, right? Also, Gavaltic thing on, on Seder night. A dog did not, how do they translate? Lick its palate? No, growl. bark. Growl. Growl. What? Growl. No dogs growled, by the way. You know, I'd like to one day, if I'd be married. You know, you have Torah Mythbusters. You know, you have Mythbusters. There used to be show Mythbusters, right? Sure. Yeah. Torah Mythbusters. One of the Segulot, one of the famous Segulot. You've heard this before? That big Segula. Segula is like a... Merit. No, a Segula is more like an action that can that could perpetuate a manifestation of something. They say if you're getting attacked by a dog and you say this verse, the dog won't attack you. Go try it. <laughs> right? I wanted to get a guy with a helmet. Don't feed the dog for a week. Try it. Say the verse. You know? I can't read Hebrew. Okay. No, they say if a person says this, if they're ever attacked by a dog, it is one of those segulot. Post barbecue. I mean, you're talking about major. What do they have outside the stadiums for the people who don't go in outside? Tailgaters. Tailgaters, right? They have the barbecue outside. They're not in the stadium watching the yeah. the sports thing. They're outside. You know, you're talking about a whole city, whatever the core, however big it was, the op, the place they took, where it's just yeah. all haish everywhere. Mongol city, okay? And Mongols, I think they call them in, in Hebrew where they have the little barbecue grills. Okay? So, you know, and, and still the dogs aren't barking. You'd think that they would be... Evil was already eradicated. It was almost gone. And that's his point here. Okay? Fim came, Where was the place for the ruling of, shli, of, of Tuma, of defilement? How could defilement rule at that time? That's the question here. Again, the question. We all understand that the reason they had to leave Egypt early was because they might fall into the 50th gate of Tuma. But according to the way we're understanding everything, the revelation of God's divine light on that night was so high and so sublime 
How could Tuma even exist at that time? When God reveals himself, Tuma is already gone. All defilement. All that stuff is gone. Everybody's in a euphoric high. God forbid. They entered into 49 levels of Tuma, of defilement, like we say above. And from the words of the Zohar Chadash, Reish, he's a very big bucky. He likes to quote things as he's going, right? Reish, Parshish, Yisro. But since the Geula, the redemption has already started, which is from the very beginning of the Makot, which according to him, astoundingly, is 12 months. I always thought it was 10 months, the situation of the Makot. In other words, the length of time for the Makot was classically known to be a 10-month um, length of time. It was like one month, Maka, one month plague, three weeks off, one week, sorry, one week plague, three weeks off, one week plague, three weeks off, it was like one a month. But here, I don't know how he figures this out, and I didn't do a, a total a total research in this, he says that the Makot was a 12 month, okay, it was 12 months long, okay, but he has it, there's a Gomorrah which says so, okay. Mishpat HaMitzrim Yud Beit Chodesh that the judgment of the Egyptians was 12 months V'kein B'Seder Olam Okay, he brings all these and conquered until it Ad Shalom Haya Omed It was it was barely, barely there V'yim Kein Ayei Mekom Az L'Shisas Shar So therefore he says basically the point here is how can it be that we say that the, the 50th gate would rule at the night of Passover, that they had to leave so fast? Okay? So, Gam Be'ikar Hadvarim. He wants to give you a little background here. It's a nice little background. I don't know if you have it in your text because I didn't go through the entire English. And the essence of the thing, and the topic of the 50th gate of Tuma, of defilement, behold, also... She is here also at Gamkin Haramach. Rabbi Moshe Cordovero also mentions it in his books Sefer Pardes, in uh, Shar Hasharim, the Gate of Gates. I guess that's the name of his chapter in Perak Aleph. He does mention that there is a 50th Gate of Tuma. However, the Vilna Gon, the Gra, he mentions, he brings down from a verse in Mishlei, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 16, number 4. In the verse, Kol Paal Hashem Lema'anehu, everything that Hashem does is for His sake. He says, Ki, He says over there, Ki la sitra achra eno rak mem tip shari tuma. He brings down, this is an astounding fact for you all to keep and put in your pocket. The, the other side, completely, because why? We entered into the 49th level and we stood there. Okay, which means, there's no 50th, but that is the utmost extreme of defilement, of distance that a person can reach. Okay? If they, that gate, if the 49th gate was completely filled, so then what we say, and other, other commentaries bring down, we would have been completely lost. What does it mean completely lost? There were three things that they did keep in Egypt, right? Who knows what those three things were? They didn't change their language, their names, their names or their style of dress. Right. And they walked like an Egyptian. They <laughs> walked like an Egyptian. <laughs> they didn't walk like a Jew. We had that in the Zohar class last Wednesday. They recognized this guy and they go, he's dressed like a Jew and he walked like a Jew. Okay? Hmm. That's the new for, uh, song. Bahari al kol panim hu ki ein la sitra so he wants to say, bottom line, the forces of the dark side do not have a 50th gate at all. But Gam Lehamem Tet, also, in terms of even in talking about the 49 levels of Tuma, they're filled, it's impossible. Right? Because why? The way that, that it is explained in some commentaries that there was still a very faint, even though they didn't change those three things, they were involved in a lot of other Egyptian life. Right? Just those three things. And the very faint signal in their heart that they were descendants from Abraham was barely, barely there. Yep. Okay. So we say that if the 49th level would have reached its full, even that sign, even that signal would not be there. 
Lacharia Baze, I'm not going to decide in this argument between the Vilna Gaon and the Moshe Kodavero. Ah, Ha'emes, Nitan Likitu, but the truth is it's given to the writ. Ein Sof. When we speak of the 50th gate, we call that Ein Sof. Ein Sof means no end. It's a level of consciousness where a person reaches complete unity. There is no, it's almost like Ein Sof means you're not there anymore. Okay? Okay, go to the next paragraph. Let us come back. After he's explained something that maybe you have heard, maybe you haven't heard, there is no 50th gate of Tuma, in his opinion. Also, according to the opinion that there is a 50th gate in the Sidrachra, also, he wants to say it is impossible to say that this was the intention of what that was, it is written, that they would, could not be delayed anymore. That it is in order that they did not enter the 50th gate. Why? Because he says in the first night of Passover, there was no other further space for the rule of Tuma. Even if you want to say there's a 50th gate, it can't be that it still has any force or any power or any influence on the night of Passover itself. Rather, the intention is the opposite, that the place where was revealed the Kodesh Baruch Hu, the light of His Holiness, on the Jewish people, like what the Baal Haggadah writes, that God revealed, God Himself, the King of the King of the Kings, the Holy One, Blessed Be He, revealed Himself to them. And this is the point that he wants to say. Right? This is the real point. Yes. Tight spot. Mm -hmm. So God says, we got to split the sea. And the angels came to him and says, why? Right? And he says, because we've got to let the Jewish people go. And what are you going to do with the Egyptians? We're going to drown. Right? And the angels came back and says, whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. These are involved in idolatry, and they're doing idolatry. What's the difference? Whatever you do, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Okay. Whatever you do for them, you got to do for them. Dry land, dry land. Equal, equal. Right? So God says, well, I don't care. <laughs> right? We got to do this. Okay? Yeah. There was a huge kitru. There was a huge prosecution in heaven. Okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that. They are doing idols. They're idols. They're, they're, they're idolaters. They brought idols with them. People from the tribe of Dan had it in their packs. They had a little getchkas. You know what a getchka is? <laughs> getchka, little idol. <laughs> So it was a huge thing that went on in the sea, and that's really where Hashem had to... to the people were not on a level to have this kind of salvation done to them. To eradicate evil would be this kind of catch-22 kind of deal. Okay? There's a tikkun. They need to be fixed. They need to be... They, they have, if you can't... If you receive the holiness and the schmutz is inside of you, the schmutz gets bigger. You know, I took energy healing um, years ago. You know, put the hands and do this kind of thing. You know, it was kind of, you know, it was like the coolest class of it. I paid a fortune for all these other classes, but like the cheapest class was the best class, right? It was about doing the energy healing and feeling the energy on people. And it was really cool. Not Reiki. That's, okay, just kidding. It is, but, you know. Um, and they told me, you can't do cancer patients. You can't work with people with who have cancer. Because when you... Okay? So the idea really is that well, that's why we had to leave Egypt so fast. Was because if we wouldn't leave Egypt so fast, evil would be completely gone. In other words, it's not the fact that we were going to fall to the 50th gate of, of Tuma. That's not it. It's we would have gone through the roof. Okay? like that. The light was so high it would have just taken us to a completely different place that we weren't fitting to go to. Okay? Too bright. Okay? So therefore we couldn't, we had to keep free will in the game. Okay? 
let's just finish here a little bit, mm -hmm. okay? Ki ha Mitzrayim haya az harosh l'kol haklipa, the Mitzrayim, or Ki Mitzrayim, Egypt was the head of all of the klipa. So when it was nullified, Egypt and its influence, so then it would be nullified all of the forces, all of the dark forces. And then the evil inclination will also become nullified completely. And then there would no, be no place for free will at all. And because of this, they could not be, they could not delay. And this is what it writes, that the Egyptians were strong on the people to quicken, to send them from the land. Kiamru, because they did say, and this is what the verse says, we're all dying. Therefore, Therefore, they needed to go out very fast, very quickly, in order to give still a little bit of existence to evil, and in order that there should be a place for free will and to, to bring the, uh, the, the total cause of creation, which is, we have to make the choice in the end. Okay? So the, the idea here is, we'll stop now. Um, we'll continue this in Mir Hashem, or I'll find another translation. Baruch Hashem, I found this translation. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the idea really is the light on Seder night is a tremendous light. And the reason why we had to leave so fast is not because we're You can skip, you can quantize to a higher level without going through levels. It's, all of a sudden you can end up on the highest level of consciousness without doing any kind of... Uh, Pre, what we call it, um, warm-ups. Warm -ups. Okay, it's like you become the super athlete with absolutely no training whatsoever.